This episode contains discussion of suicidal ideation. Viewer discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Theo. And I'm Scarlett. And welcome to the Theo's Book Club podcast, where we talk about queer books. And bubble tea. Today we'll be interviewing Sean David Hutchinson, author of The Past and Other Things That Should Stay Buried. Make sure you check out our website, theosbookclub.com, where you can read more of Theo's thoughts on the book, find a link to get your own copy of the book, and join the conversation in our forums. If you're like Scarlet and prefer to read with your ears, you can check out theosbookclub.com slash audible, where you can sign up for a free trial and listen to all your favorite books. That's theosbookclub.com slash A-U-D-I-B-L-E to start your own free trial. And the best part is you get a free book download that you can keep forever. So if you enjoy this, please share it with your friends and family and like... And also definitely subscribe. Now off to the interview. Queer books and queer topics and queer people that won't stop talking. So read and chat it up at Theo's Book Club. Hi everyone, I'm Theo and I use he him pronouns. And I'm Scarlett and I use she her. And we are here today with Sean David Hutchinson. Hi, I'm Sean. I use he him pronouns. Yay. So happy to have you on our episode today. Oh, thanks for having me. Before we really get into the interview, we uh, like to take some time off the top to really get to know our authors. These are going to be the hardest questions you've ever been asked. <laughs> are you emotionally, <laughs> physically, spiritually prepared for this important pop quiz? I, oh goodness, I do hope so. My mother okay. has been in town, so I'm a little emo- <laughs> emotionally uh, overwrought this week. <laughs> No, no, I'm kidding. I love my mom. Overall. She's been wonderful. We we ate pie instead of instead of dinner last night. Oh, pie's dinner. Pie's dinner. Yeah, right? <laughs> pie pie is dinner, right? Well, that's a that's a great place to start our questions. Then, okay, here we are. The five hardest questions you'll ever be asked. One, two, three. One. What's your favorite pie? Uh, lemon meringue. Uh, what kind of socks are you wearing right now? None. Whoa. Um, what is your favorite kind of building? Uh, it's single story buildings. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, what um, was your favorite tree to sit under as a kid? Oh, gosh. I don't know what it was called, but it was this this tree with uh, this papery, um, papery bark that a, they had at the school when I was in elementary tree? school. No, I don't think it was birch. I mean, it was like, it was real thin, like paper, and it used to just kind of pull off. And oh. um, yeah, it was weird. Cool. It, maybe it's a Florida thing. <laughs> uh, and then last question. Um, what's your favorite kind of bubble tea? Okay. I, I've never had bubble tea. I've That's... never had Go it. Go get, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. Like, and we're going to stop. And, we're going to take a break everywhere. until you, yeah. It's everywhere. <laughs> It's everywhere here, and I and I just I have not had bubble tea. You I... know what it is? It, I think it freaks me out. It's very overwhelming your first the... time when you yes. just walk in and you've never you don't know what to order. It is overwhelming. The menus are very overstimulating. There's so many choices. How can you possibly know what to order? But also, <laughs> like when you're actually eating it texturally, it can be a bit of a, a surprise. And yes. that was my initial aversion to it. It's only during the pandemic that Theo got me into it. It's only in the last couple of years that I've been drinking it. So I totally understand that you haven't had it yet, but yep. I would recommend trying it. And this is funny because okay. Scarlett looked at the book cover and went, why is there bubble tea on the front? <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to actually explain that it's a slushie. <laughs> um, Wait, okay. So as, segue. As, as someone who's never had bubble tea, what bubble tea should I have? My favorite is, so there's like milk teas, there's like um, like green tea. So I'll do like a fruity green tea. So it's almost like a juice, but I'll put okay. like tapioca in, in it. Um, okay. That's what I usually get. I like to get a brown sugar milk tea because it's like classic black tea, but it's like very sweet. Mm-hmm. Ooh, that sounds good. Yummy like dessert. Yummy yeah. dessert. <laughs> <laughs> Dead. Yeah. Okay, well. Yeah, this is all to say uh, not bubble tea on the front cover, even though oh, we've, yeah. you would think maybe it might be. No. <laughs> I was like, oh, interesting. Skeletons and bubble tea. That's fun. I wonder yeah. what that means. <laughs> oh. it's, a, it's a very morbid bubble tea. It's a yeah, kind yeah. of jelly. I don't know. Yeah, it's like tapioca. It's kind of like marrow. Yeah. Okay, anyways, oh, wow. Off track already. Um, yes, so as I've already showed, we are talking about the past and other things that should stay buried today. I love this book. I think it's so inventive and and um it's great. Yeah. <laughs> like what was I going to say? <laughs> um I was, this is why this is why Scarlett's here because I'm just going to be like so good. I love it. Wow. Such great. <laughs> and I need to be so kept th- on That's track. how I review books. Great. Yeah. 
<laughs> like my official review, if you go on the website, it's going to be like, wow, much so good. <laughs> Amazing. Please read. <laughs> um, so um, diving right in, um, one of the main things we actually have to talk about, of course, is how we process grief <laughs> you know this is well okay so yeah. we're go- just off the top we're going very light we're going very light very <laughs> <fine>. <laughs> um but this is something that you know I-, I connect with books like this personally because it's something i think about you know um mm-hmm. like how we before you get into yeah. this can you give the listeners at home a little bit of context for how we process grief Oh, is there an like, answer? Well, no. Like, what in the book prompts this question? Okay, actually, I'll let Sean. Sean, do you want to give, like, a really quick rundown of kind of the plot? Because you're obviously going to say sure. better than, that, than I ever have. Oh. oh, I'm terrible at this. But no, I'll give it a go. Um, I've always been, much to my my publisher's uh, dismay, I'm right. terrible at this. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so the story is about uh, two best friends, Dino and July. And before the story begins, July passes away suddenly. And uh, Dino's family runs a funeral home. And on the the night before her funeral, or I think it's two days before her funeral, uh, July comes back to life. Um, And she's kind of a zombie, but not really, she's not like the brain eating kind of zombie, like, but she does come back to life. And um, Dino is the only one who knows. And so they spend a few days trying to sort of uh, dissect and repair their friendship, just in case she, you know, winds up dead again. Um, And meanwhile, because she's back to life, everybody else in the world stops dying. Mm-hmm. No, everyone's whoa. No one, right? yeah. <laughs> no one else died. You're like, wow, this sounds like a good book. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> because that's like, like that's July. Like, if July can't die, nobody can die. Yeah. Does July have like special? Like, is July death? Like, does she have special powers, or it's just like? This is a great question, actually. It, I, I mean, or it's like just this. It, the universe did this. The it's you know the universe just did this. Okay. Okay. That's actually really yeah. again. Oh my god! I didn't. Even okay, think you're that. you're surprised that I would ask an insightful question. No, is because concerning. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is my best friend, everyone. Because this is something that I am now thinking about in the context of the book. Is like, did you imagine July as like, like the Grim Reaper or a symbol of death or anything like that? No, no. Okay. Um, I mean, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything because I've had a lot right. of really wonderful readers. Uh, come up to me after reading my books and and give me their theories on why certain things have happened and right. they're often much better than what I had in my head. <laughs> just I go with it at that point. So just, You're like, yes, that, like, you got yeah, it. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Wow, you you saw right into my soul with that. That you absolutely nailed it. <laughs> just lean into it for sure. Yeah, I guess we're gonna get. I'm like, how do I stay light? But it's uh, okay. So, so now that we have context that right. someone has died. Ask your question again about processing grief. <laughs> I guess, well, I guess this book operates on like different levels, right? It's like, A, how do we process grief? But also, how do we process grief with someone we don't currently see a relationship with? Or maybe someone like from our past, right? Mm. So it's, it's almost like those things we left buried, as the title suggests, right? How do we process, how do we, because like Dino would have had to grieve that, the end of that relationship, friendship, right? So it's right. almost like this double um processing of grief Mm. you know um how do you i guess sean have is any of your own experiences been written into the book or or ways you've processed grief in this i guess in in the way you've kind of outlined in this novel um not specifically like i've never lost like my best friend Mm -hmm. um but i mean of course i have you know had those types of friendships you know people that you are intensely close to and then for whatever reason you fall out and um, and you do grieve, you know, the end of that friendship. Um, and and when I was, you know, mining the emotions and trying to figure out how I did this, I actually took my my friendship with my best friend, uh, a woman named Rachel. We've been friends since we were fourteen, and um, and so we have had the entire full spectrum of you know fights and makeups and and everything. And and I took that and I compressed it down into you know just a couple of days and to 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 sort of. Uh, come up with with how Dino and July do the postmortem on their friendship, um, because I think so much of of you know what happens with those friendships that fall out is it's all about miscommunication, yeah. um, and and which was ultimately actually why I decided because originally it was just going to be from Dino's point of view, and as I got about halfway through. And the book was due. I emailed my editor and I was like, I really think that this needs to be from both of their points of view. And she was like, wow, that's going to be a lot of work. Do you think you can still make your deadline? And I was like, do I have to? It's like, I would really like it if you yeah. could. So, 
Um, I love that. You know, yeah. So, you know, but getting that and, and, you know, having that overlap in the book. So you get to see Dino describe how something, you know, happened. And then, you know, July comes in and describes how she thinks it happened. Yeah. Um, you know, and then I think that there is, is their story and their friendship and, and what happens is, is to me, it is as much about, you know, learning how we process grief, but it's also sort of a call to action saying like, don't wait to, you know, to talk to the people that you have been fighting with or that you have had a fight with. Like, don't wait. Like Dino gets this opportunity and, and yeah. Dino and July get the opportunity to fix their friendship, but people just generally don't. Like once somebody dies, that's it. So um, it was more of a call to action, you know, just a reminder, like, don't let these things go. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I think the split narrative is in, is perfect for this novel because they're both unreliable narrators. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, so obviously we see everything just from Dino's perspective, which then like July mm -hmm. corroborates in a completely different way later. Like they have many fights yes. where Dino's like, you did this thing. And then like a hundred pages later, she'll be like, I did it because I was protecting you. And Dino would right. have never known that had mm -hmm. July not come back to life. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a brilliant way of having two unreliable narrators. And, and as the audience, we kind of get the story between both of their perspectives. Yes. We're like, oh, okay. Well, I, and I think that, yeah. Oh no, I like, it was just like, I think that in, you know, cause we do like, we talk a lot about unreliable narrators, you know, mm -hmm. and, and how they, you know, especially in young adult literature, but I, like, I have a thing, like anytime you are writing or you're reading a book from a first person perspective, the relator or the, the narrator is unreliable because yep. we're all unreliable narrators. Like everybody, like we are the worst people, <laughs> you know, to, to tell our own stories because we are, we are biased um, and unreliable. And, um, I, I think, yeah, I mean, it was just really great to sort of see that and then allow readers to, you know, to sort of make up their mind in the middle. Um, mm -hmm. and I'd kind of actually considered at one point adding a third narrator to sort of be like the person who's like, both of you are wrong and both of you are, are remembering this incorrectly, but then that just seemed like too much. Who would have been the third narrator if you did that? I don't know. I would have had to make like, there's a completely else. different, like no one that's in the story currently. Right. Okay, cool. I was like, Rafi could have had a cool... Yeah, but but Rafi would have come in too late. Right? Like yeah. Rafi wouldn't have been a long... It, it would have had to have been... I would have had to have, have created like a long-term third wheel best friend. Right. And I, I just... It was just too much at that point. Yeah. I do, I do like the two of them having to hash it out between the two of them. I yes. think that is... I think that does speak to your, your point about like, don't wait, right? Mm. Yeah. Like they don't have... They don't have a third person intervening. I mean, they have the universe intervening. <laughs> You know, of right. course, but uh, I guess that is our third narrator. She, she is dead and didn't she, come back to life. She did come back to life. I guess there is something else I'm There's like, here. it's not normal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, I do like yeah. that. I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I've definitely experienced Yeah. So do you wear clothes? How about shirts? This is a really cool one from everybody on stage. They're sick. Watch this. Wow. You've never seen someone put on a shirt like that before. If you want to get one of these cool shirts, go to everybodyonstage.com slash Theo and use the code Theo for 20% off. Theo's doing it. And the other thing about the unreliable narrator, which again, like most YA, like these are teenagers, right? And I have to remind myself, like while I'm reading it, I'm like, oh my God, why would you say that? Or why? Just go to your parents. Yeah. It's like, these are like teenagers dealing with this like world changing thing that's happening, right? Mm. Like most, yes. most teenagers can't deal with basic things. Let alone like, okay, you've actually been reanimated and nobody's dying. Most thirty-two year old women can't <laughs> deal with basic things. Forget my I mean, most, my dead best friends say, back to the dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like I couldn't deal with that. I would be like, whoa, yeah. like no, I don't that's think that's too much. So. Yeah. But no. It's and that's actually it's, it's and I'm glad you brought that up because it's actually like one of the most frustrating things uh, about you know, writing YA and having adult readerships. Like, yeah. you know, I love my adult readers. Um, but I, I write for teens yeah. and, and it's so frustrating when I have adult readers like, oh my God, these teens are acting like teens. teens and it's like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, like, <laughs> of course they are. You know, like, it's not just like, they don't have the experience to deal with some of these things. It's yeah. like for most of them, for most of their experiences, these are like the first times that they're dealing with a lot of these things. And right. so like, 
when the, you know, when people are like, oh, why are they so excited about, you know, going on a date? And it's like, well, maybe it's their first date. <laughs> yeah, like, they're like 16. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, like all of these experiences are new to them. Right. Um, which is, is one of the reasons I like writing for young adults, because there is that sort of like idealism and optimism that, that is often, you just can't tap into in adult literature because, you know, a lot of these experiences are just, you know, old hat, like they've been done before. Um, but with teens, it's all new. So yeah, like the way that they sort of deal with this in, in the past and other things that should stay buried was um, is interesting to, to work. Through. Yeah, it's great. But even like, it's like, imagine you're a teenager and you're navigating your queerness and also your best friend is alive again. <laughs> Yes. Right. It's like not only kind are they teen. Yeah. It's not only are they teenagers <laughs> dealing with being a teen. Being life. We're yeah. now putting them into these like absolutely wild situations. Do you yes. do you find a difference in your um young readership versus your adult readership and their willingness to buy into the premise of something? Like if I'm putting oh, myself yeah. into the shoes of Dino. If I'm in a situation where there is a dead body that comes to life, I'm not hanging around. I am out of the room immediately. I'm not hashing things out with my dead best friend. Uh-uh. No. We're I'm not, I'm done. I'm done. So <laughs> does an adult readership see that and go, this is totally unbelievable? Whereas a teen readership might be like, oh yeah, I'm here for this. Dead bodies, sign me up. Do you notice a difference? Yeah. I mean, maybe not that particular example, but do you notice a difference? I mean, I definitely do. I mean, I, I really definitely do. I, um, I notice it. I noticed it a little earlier in my career. By this point in my career, I think people kind of like it's it's kind of my brand. Like, okay, there's going to be like a really emotionally intense story, and then something weird is going to happen. Um, and they just kind of know that like go with the weird, and and that's how it'll go. But um, what I actually find interesting is the thing that adults have a tendency to have a harder time buying into in in this book, is they 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 went along with the zombie part but they had a tough time believing that dino would stay friends with july they were like july's <laughs> such an awful character i can't stand her why would he stay friends with her yeah. and i'm like i'm like like that's what you're having a hard time believing like <laughs> but also they ever haven't have been friend friends who is like like that's the whole friends. premise of the book <laughs> they have but not I'm also yeah. like well it's like they, they weren't like why is he giving her an extra you know giving her right. another chance and i'm like because that's what you do with friends. And and hasn't everyone had a friend who's just like a little bit extra? Yeah. And, you know, like July Don't. is that friend. But also like, <laughs> but like Dino is also not the greatest friend either. Sure, yeah. he's like low key and a little more relaxed, but he's also kind of passive aggressive. And, yeah. you know, and, and so I don't think either of them come out of the story, you know, looking particularly wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, like they both played a part in, in the death of the friendship. And um, Do you, is but this yeah, book like, our future? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no. As we learned, if I reanimate, you're out of there. Oh, you're yeah, not true, sticking around. True. Yeah, no. <laughs> That's what we learned today. <laughs> Um, but I mean, but Sean, to our earlier point too, again, like, is July a bad friend or is she a teenager? Right. This is the whole thing. Like she's, is she, you like, know what I mean? Like, you mean like, is she a bad friend both, or, is, yeah. or she just hasn't learned how exactly. to be a good friend and I, think, and I think you can be both. I think she's both. I think she's a bad friend and then she has room to grow because she's literally a teenager. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Which is again. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, and I, I think that in, in a, in a realistic world, because like I said, you know, like I, I, I drew a lot of inspiration from my own best friendship is like when my best friend Rachel and I fought, like we didn't talk for like two or three years before we, you know, like fixed things. Yeah. And and in this, it's a much, com much more compressed timeline. So maybe in a realistic world, you know, if, if July hadn't died, they might not have been friends for a long time. Um, but I think mm -hmm. that, you know, death sort of has a way of putting things into perspective and it kind of gave, gave them both that, um, it, 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 I don't want to say inspired, it spurred them on to be like, okay, maybe we just need to, to really push through this and, and work through it. And it's not like, it's not an easy, an easy thing that they do. Like they, they still continue to fight. And I think that I tried to show like why they were having so many problems. Right. And I mean, um, I think very successfully, I, I, I completely, get, <laughs> I, I completely get these characters. I get it. I'm like, Oh, I've, I've absolutely been there. You know, yeah. I've had these fights. I, it's 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 yeah. it's things that we've all experienced. Mm. You know, it's like outrageous um, circumstances for <laughs> very real, yeah. you know, things happening. Yes. Um, I do yeah. want to go. And, oh, sorry. Continue. Oh, no, no. Go ahead. I was just going to kind of pivot because I like this whole idea. Um, but um, you you have you kind of bring up in the 
book, especially because Dino's family owns the, you know, funeral home. So they're like they're they're always talking about death. They're always thinking about death. Yes. Um, and you mentioned that like funerals are for the dead, but then we also have July, who's not dead, experiencing her own funeral. So yes. I guess like <laughs> I guess like what are the ramifications of that for you? It's like we've established that funerals aren't for the dead. Because they're generally not. Sorry, are you saying they right. are for the dead or they aren't for they the dead? They aren't for the dead. Aren't for the dead. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, but yeah. July gotcha. experiences her own funeral. Right. Because they can't tell the adults that she's not dead. So she ends up going through with the funeral. Oh, so she's like, she's like. She gets buried. She gets buried. She gets buried. Yes. She gets in the, and, in the and bubble a, tea. <laughs> and not going to lie, not going to lie, like that scene where, where because uh, Dino has to go uh, dig her back up. Yeah. That. That scene where she pops out of the coffin, yeah, it was one of my favorite things in the world to write. And oh yeah, because <laughs> um, I forget what she says. Does she do jazz hands? I'm pretty sure she does jazz. That hands. That feels right. That Brilliant. feels right for July. Brilliant. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you know, yeah, like she has a cell phone in the coffin with her. So like while the funeral is going on, she's texting Dino yeah. through the funeral. Who who doesn't um, know if she is still not dead or not? So he's right. at her funeral receiving texts from her. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I love it so much. That's hilarious. So it's, yeah, I mean, it was just all like, you know, but I think that the ramifications are really intense because like, um, I don't want to go too dark, but like one of my, right. like one of my things in my past was uh, I attempted to end my life when I was 19 and ended up in, you know, ICU for a couple of weeks and all of that. And, um, and so it's something that I have thought about, you know, and, and so I think having to sort of like face her own death and face the funeral and, and see how people would be reacting um, probably was necessary for her to get to a point where, you know, she kind of understood like, Oh, this is a, this is a real thing. Like this is happening. And, and there are more important things maybe than staying mad. So I think it was definitely like a growth point for her. Yeah. Um, and if you haven't ever read it and I'm going to completely forget the name, no, it's Henry, Dent, Henry, Dent, no, Denton Little's Death Date. Um, and it's, you, you, uh, it, it is also about uh, people who, but it's about people who find out like they know ahead of time the day they're going to die. And so there's a lot about people attending their funerals kind of ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really interesting and, and it deals with grief in, in a really interesting way. And then of course there's Adam Silvera's Yeah, uh, they both I was just bring, yeah. yeah, which, and I'm excited to read the the sequel. Mm -hmm. um, the first, the, the first, first to die. The end. I, yeah. Yeah. So, um, we'll talk about, I'll, I'll tell yeah, you what I mean, okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, like July experienced her own funeral. I, I mean, like I, there's a lot of humor because that was how I kind of pitched it was, it was like, you know, it's, it's a comedy about death. Um, and so I wanted to keep it very light so that, you know, it didn't become too overbearing and, and too overwhelming. And, you know, but I think July uses throughout the book. And I, I hope that readers really saw that she used this humor as a masking tool to, to, you know, keep from having to, to really express how she feels. And, and so I hope that readers kind of understood her humor throughout a lot of that was, was a defense mechanism mm -hmm. um, to avoid having to deal with the truth. I hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. We've really enjoyed talking to you about the books today. Um, we just want to take this moment to let you know about Audible. Really fantastic service where you can actually listen to books. You don't have to read. How cool is that? If you go to theosbookclub.com slash audible, that's theosbookclub.com slash A-U-D-I-B-L-E. You can start a free trial today. And the best part is you'll get to download a book and keep that one for free. So after you've heard it, you can hear it again whenever you want. Audible. Noise. <laughs> uh, Theo. Yeah. Do you have a favorite quote from the I book? I do. This is a great one. I'm really, I really look at you so, ready so, to <laughs> go. I was ready. I have so many notes. I've had to compile them. <laughs> okay. This is my favorite quote from the book. Okay. Okay. Love is gradual and sneaky. It grows like weeds between the cracks of a hundred average moments. Oh, my heart. Sean. Okay. <laughs> that broke me. Yeah. yeah. That's good. That was sneaky. Yeah. I like sneaky, that. Sneaky, yeah. sneaky. I'm also the world's most sensitive person. So I was like, oh. <laughs> I'm just gonna need, just gonna, need a, gonna need a minute on that one, everyone. Yeah, I can see that. I can yeah. see that. I did cry both you know times what? I read the book. No surprise Aww. to anyone, but um, lots of <laughs> lots of tears.
Yeah. Um, well, you know, I always know that like I've kind of nailed something. Like if I get to a scene and I start crying, which I mean, it sounds a little like, oh, oh you no, cry. No, I completely. Books, like it, yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah. Like not during the first drafts, but like when I'm getting like to the end and and I start and I like it's polished. If I start crying, and I'm like, oh, okay, this is this is good. I got it. I nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> like and that that's how I know. Um, you, so I get it. Yeah, you I am right. so over emotional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have you ever have you ever gotten into a book and like gotten to a scene? that you've written that is like too emotional and you're like actually i have to rewrite this this can't happen i love these characters too much we're not doing this have you like ever like axed something that you've written because you found it too emotional for yourself no um honestly when it's too like if it's too much like that's how i i know that like i should keep going <laughs> <Okay>. um <laughs> because it's just you know like it's one of the things that that i really strive for when I when I do it is just like emotional honesty in in every way like I, I never go for the like I'm gonna kill people just for fun because right. I know this will upset everybody but um you know if if I feel like you know something if I'm like oh gosh this is like gonna break my heart to do um but it's the right thing like I, that just tells me I need to to keep going and push forward um yeah because like there was uh I my third book was this this book called uh, The Five Stage of Andrew Brawley, and it was about a young man whose parents are are killed in an accident, and he ends up living in the hospital uh, where they were taken um, after the car accident. And he's like sneaks around and he lives there, but um, he ends up like volunteering at the hospital. And there was a scene where uh, a toddler is brought in who has drowned in a pool, and they have him perform CPR on the the child as practice because they know that they're the the infant is dead and. And it was a really, really tough scene to write because it's a tough scene to write with, you know, a toddler who is dead. But also it was, I went through firefighter training and EMT training and and that was what they had done to me. And it was so hard to write, but it was such a pivotal moment sort of in his evolution that it was like, okay, I'm going to write a few words and then I'm going to walk away and have a good cry. I'm going to write a few more words and walk mm. away and have a good cry. Um, and it was, but it was necessary Um for for that character's growth so yeah like um the only time yeah i pull away from from the big emotional things is if i think it feels manipulative because i hate manipulative yes. emotional stakes like i hate those mm -hmm. um and i try very hard <laughs> never to, to do that yeah well and like going off of that too so was there ever a moment when you were even conceptualizing this book where july remains alive at the end or was it always like was this always how the plot hinged on the fact that she was going to end up dead again yeah no it was there was never a chance that she was going to to remain alive right. um and and that goes like actually all the way back to my very first book which is called the death day letter i have a thing with death i can't help it i don't know why it's morbid i went through a goth phase when i was younger i don't know um <laughs> but like it was a, it's a world where everyone gets a letter 24 hours before they die and um it was it was they both die at the end but you know like 10 years sooner and adam <laughs> silvera did it better so i can't even complain um but like it was one of the things where like the first line in the book is that i let you know like this character is going to die right. like nothing is going to change that so of course with a book like this i go into it i have to go in uh you know very like set on july is not going to make it through this book because if 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 i believe that there's still a chance that she's going to survive like if i'm like underselling it or i don't like fully embrace what this book is about then i i feel like it, it would make me pull my punches on the rest of the book um and you know so i i really like there was never a chance where where she was going to survive this i mean the book was totally different when it first started i actually like originally envisioned it as cyrano de bergerac with zombies oh, wow. um and that really worked out very badly after about two chapters. And I went, how about if I don't do that? And uh, and I, I switched it to this. So, yeah. Um, but July always never made it through to the very end. Yeah, that's always interesting. I've written something before where I had a main character die. And someone once was like, what if they survived? And I was like, whoa. Yeah, what if they survived? <laughs> And I was like, oh, well, the plot's different now. But uh, so, right. yeah, but obviously this right. book hinges on the fact that July is not sticking around. So mm. curious. Right. Curious. And I think it's also like kind of kind of dishonest to the reader. Right. Because like if they got to the end and then July lived, then it would sort of be like turning my back on the premise of exactly. like death is permanent. You know? Yeah. The mm. book wouldn't um, hit as hard or as yeah, resonant, I, mean, I guess, as if she remained alive. 
Right. It's not like they reverse deaths so much as got a reprieve. Right. Um, and even that reprieve is something like most people don't get. Like they don't get that that last chance to be like, okay, you're definitely going to die. Um, and and you know, but you still got a little bit of time to to finish some things up. Like people don't generally get that. Right. Mm -hmm. You don't you don't get to tie up loose ends. It's just it just is. It's just yeah. it's done. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any final thoughts, Theo? Final thoughts. Oh, how, where do, how do I even summarize my thoughts? No, okay, I think. Okay, here's my question. Yeah, here's my question. You, you asked me a question. Sean, hold on yeah. for a second. Scarlett has a question for me. Okay. Yeah. No, just <laughs> I just died. Okay. What loose end did you want to tie up? Um, I would, uh, that you have not read a book. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> And then if you reanimate it, I'd be like, "We're getting, we're, if I'm gonna I come read back you." Like, he was like, "Okay, you're gonna, you have 48 hours to live. You yeah. have to just read the whole." Here's time. a list to pick from of my favorites. You're gonna read one of these. All right? Dead. I can see that. Like you pop up, and like the first thing is he hands you a book, and you're like, "What? What?" Huh? You're like, "No, I'm just unfazed." Read. Just read. Yeah. I want unfazed by the reanimation. I'm like, "Oh, thank God you're back." All right, I only you have got 48 hours book. to live. I want bubble tea, not books. <laughs> well, you, can, you can sip while you're. Oh, I can, I can do both. I can, can do, do both. both. It's, it's solved. What would you do if I reanimate? Run out of the room. We've established this. Oh, oh! If you re, I've got forty-eight hours. You've died and reanimated. You're gone. You're oh, not, you're not yeah, sticking around. I'd yeah. leave. I'd leave. That's too scary. Yeah. <laughs> There's a zombie. <laughs> and then me alone by myself. I'm like, all right. Well. What if he attacks? <laughs> <laughs> oh my it is goodness! A, it is a legitimate concern, and it's it's Dino definitely had that concern. Yeah, no, no, I wouldn't uh, survive. You would just, you would literally attack me, and I would, <laughs> I would immediately like, dead again. Have you, have you, um, asked this question of your best friend? What would happen if you had died and you were reanimated, and she was the one there? Have you yeah, had this conversation? No, she would, she would probably also run away screaming. No, we haven't had that conversation. <laughs> but she, I mean, she read an early draft of the book, and you know, and and so she definitely had some input. Mm. Um, but you know, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure she would also run away screaming, or she would just be like, oh, like really, like you on. again? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, Scarlett, why don't you come back? <laughs> Yeah. Like, isn't 30 years enough? I've had to deal with you. Go away. <laughs> I put in my time. <laughs> yeah. You're like, that's it. We've, I've said all I could say. Yeah. All right. Well. I love that. I just want to thank you so yeah. much again for coming on. This was Thank you fantastic. so much. This was a lovely chat. Yeah. Yay. Oh, thank y'all for having me. This was awesome. Yes. Thanks Where so can much. everyone find you? Uh, um, online, online. You, we don't <laughs> yeah. need an every, every time. time we ask this question, we're like, where, can, where, where are you specifically? If we could get latitude, longitude, yeah, <laughs> no. yeah, um, like um, an Instagram handle, no, maybe. No, yeah, um, yeah, I don't. So I don't really do a lot of social media. I'm on Twitter, um, where I talk about everything but books. Um, <laughs> Perfect for to, again, my publisher's yeah. dismay. <laughs> um, uh, and then just yeah, my website, uh, SeanDavidHutchinson.com. Um, because you know Instagram, I hate pictures of me, so I'm just like I always forget, and then I forget to take pictures of like food and things like that. Right. So, and Facebook is weird, and Amen. and nobody wants me on TikTok. Trust me, <laughs> nobody wants. That. No, even my public, they're like, why don't you try TikTok? And I'm like, why don't I not? <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. Thank and you so much. I think that's all we have. I think that's all we have. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Theo's Book Club is executive produced by Greg Crothers for everybody on stage. This episode is written by Robert Popoli and Chelsea Jane Bray. Our producer is Denise Niles with production assistance by Alicia Tablin, directed by Greg Crothers. Our theme song is written and performed by Robert Popoli and mixed and mastered by Rob Russo. Theo'sBookClub.com. 